Good afternoon. Or morning for some. Those of you that really, really want freedom, they have it easy compared to those that don't really, really want freedom. Raise your hand if you think you really, really want freedom. Nice, you're all full of shit. I love you so much. No, of course there's an ounce of truth in there. But, if you increase that desire, she can do it in several ways. Then it becomes quite easy. The path becomes very simple. It's not very complex. It's not very journey-ish anymore. Straight to the point. So, what just came up, I didn't plan on this, but what just came through to transmit today is the simplicity of enlightenment and take that all the way, or at least make it really, really clear to you how easy it is, how you can replace every other tool in your toolbox would just want. The only prerequisite is that you really, really want freedom. So that, by the end of the session, you feel like there's nothing else to do. Now, that requires that you really, really want freedom. Otherwise, there will always be something to do. So there's two types of seekers in a way, there's one who's really fascinated and interested in the journey and the ups and downs and how to do this and how to do that and how to solve this and how to create that and what to do if this happens and what to do if you feel like that. And there's the type of seeker that has no time for that or feels like they have no time for that and they just want the freedom more than anything else. What if there was one solution to all problems? Every time you 
feel bad. And every time you feel good, which is also a problem, it can be resolved. And again, only one who really wants the freedom will be able to apply this consistently. Because if you have a lot of other desires to understand things, to figure things out, to advance in certain ways, or be something, more of something, then this will not be as appealing to you. Consider the universe with all of its infinite expressions, waves, ripples, emotions, one may wonder where does it end? When is there a resolve? And are we not all working somehow towards the completion of creation, the resolve of all ripples, where the river meets the ocean, becomes once again the whole body of water instead of a partial point of view. Now I think intuitively you can grok that indeed there is an end, if you will, or a resolve to the appearance of duality and that everything somehow is housed in this great union if the universe at some point in time it's completely resolved. A, what does it resolve back into? Or rather, what resolves it, what completes it? And B, when is that going to exist? That completion, that resolve. And use your intuition as I ask these questions, not your mind. Imagine the universe dissolving into a space, if you will, And let's just call this the natural state. The natural state of creation. The foundation of the universe. So let's say there's a natural state to all phenomena. And at the end of the universe, all things are resolved. Do you understand this word, resolved? in this context reabsorbed there's no more problem it's resolved it's done it's freed up it's liberated it's released the problem is resolved the illusion is resolved resolution completion absorption release relaxation you could even say healing Forgiveness or love or perfection, wholeness, resolve, to resolve. To take something that arises that appears to be one thing and to resolve it 
or to resolve that it's not what it seemed to be. And when you see that something is not what you thought it was, the problem is resolved, depending on what you replace that perspective with. If we could replace every perspective with the natural state, we would actively be participating in the ongoing resolve of the universe. We would utilize our lifetime to help resolve creation, to help complete creation. As for question B, when? If this natural state is there at the end of the universe, when everything is resolved, And if this is the natural state of all phenomena, of all things, even though there are no things, of all perceptions, then must it not be here now too? Can space not be here now, but suddenly appear when things resolve? There's a natural state of existence itself that's not born of the mind. It's not created by any of your thoughts or experiences. And that natural state is already here. What if the human mind could be trained to recognize it directly? before mind, during mind, after mind. What if every emotion you have can be resolved with one trick? Bring your attention to notice that there is something here that registers my voice before you can even think about it. You may like what I say, you may not like what I say, but something here is that I say something. It's like the space that's here. The natural state, the natural space, the natural basic space of what appears. So there's two types of focuses, or foci. One being the focus on what appears, which is what we're very well trained in. The other type of focus is to emphasize that which perceives, receives, holds, carries, resolves the appearance, the perception. It's undeniable to all of you that you are currently existing, that you are. And that this isness, or this existence, is somehow aware of itself. Yes? So the space that's here, space of existence, is, you could say, both empty, I think it's not a thing, Otherwise, it could not hold space for all things. And it is aware. This emptiness aware. Emptiness, existence, awareness. Satchitananda. It's 
very much like space. Though even space can either be focused on as an appearance, you can focus on space, or focus on the fact there is something aware of space. Even space appears. But space is a great analogy for the natural state of existence. If emptiness is a little too vague, you can use space. If formlessness is a little too vague, you could use space, the analogy of space. And just like space, all things appear inside of it. The natural state of existence is a container for all experiences. Now, this practice that I'm going to continue to elucidate will only be interesting to you if you want freedom. If not, it'll just sound boring. Because you want things. You don't want resolve. You haven't suffered enough. <sighs> Who has suffered enough? Don't worry, if you haven't had enough, there's plenty to go around <laughs> for everyone, for all of eternity. Choose your dish. How big a slice would you like today? Let's say there's the natural state and then there's the state of suffering. We could say the unnatural state. And as a human being, as above, so below, the microcosm and the macrocosm being the same, really, the same applies to you. You can either be in a state of suffering or in a state of resolve. So another way to speak of this is There's the view, the natural state is simply the view, that which currently knows all this, that which these, that which is. And inside of the view, there are points of view. You can either have a point of view, or you can relax into the view and allow the clarity and the pristineness and the ease of softening and finally dissolving a point of view back into the natural state, harmonizing it, neutralizing it, dissolving the meaning given to a perspective, releasing it, recognizing this wide open basic state that's always already here, the natural state. Is already here. How could it not be? Whatever you are, this basic space has to always be there. It is because of this that you have even the power to have an opinion or point of view or perspective or preference. Without the view, no points of view. Without you, no you. So next time you feel so amazing about you, just remember it completely depends on you. Not on your point of view. So perspective are the cause of suffering. From a sort of absolute point of view. <laughs> what if you could resolve this right now what if as soon as a thought emotion perspective arises 
you can resolve it, bring it back to its natural state, and let the natural state resolve the perspective. Liberate you from you. But you have to not be insistent. That's why only those that really want the freedom will find the bliss and the liberation in this. You need to want freedom even more than you want bliss or happiness. But right now, all is rested in a perfect space. If you insist that it's not the case, that's the point of view. Resolve it. Give it up. Relax it two to five seconds, totally giving up all points of view and becoming the view. Recognizing the view. Recognizing the natural underlying space that's always already here and it's always already empty and it's always already aware of what arises. And it takes very little effort to do so. Maybe at first a little bit more. But it becomes more and more natural because in fact it is natural. But when you are identified with a point of view, it takes a little bit of effort to pause yourself, to stop yourself in order to recognize the view over the point of view. Descriptions are your enemy if freedom is your goal. Can you live free of descriptions? Do you want to? Or is your point of view just too goddamn fascinating? You can hold on to it, but see how it feels. See how righteous, dual, separative, entitled, arrogant, egotistical, harmful, painful it feels to hold on to a point of view. Whether it's a thought, a perspective, a material object, a social point of view. Because all is only perception in the emptiness of awareness or in the awareness of emptiness. There is only perception, perspective. If you're attached to an automobile, that's a perspective, it's a thought, it's a point of view. It doesn't exist, there's no car outside of the point of view or the experience. All the experience can be resolved back into the natural state of that which is here, always here, always now, always clear. So when you stop describing what appears for a few seconds, do you notice the clarity of the basic space that everything is held in already? Your point of view appears inside of the view, existence itself, awareness as a direct experience, as a direct truth. Not a thought. It's not a thought about awareness. It's the stopping of all thoughts and then the direct recognition of this indescribable space that remains. The I exists. The I am. But free of form or this or that. If you consistently over and over and over again, because you have a burning desire for freedom, are willing to give up your own points of view and repeatedly recognize the basic space in which points of view arise, by which points of view are recognized, thanks to which or what points of view can even have a sense of consciousness, all consciousness is ultimately derived from the natural state of awareness. It is the power that fuels all perspectives, all senses of a me, 
all senses of knowing something. Another way of describing this is instead of knowing the known, focusing on the known, you begin to know the knower. But not as a point, not as an entity, but more like a field or a space that's not localized anywhere, that's not partial to any location, simply is, cannot be described as the formless, mysterious force that enables perspectives of consciousness, experiences of self, to arise. But if you give up your control of life, if you give up your perspective of life, not for another thought, not for a nihilistic thought or a depressing thought or, oh, it all doesn't matter anyway thought. No, for the fresh, you replace it with the fresh, almost optimistic recognition of the emptiness that is here. You become curious, for starters. The curiosity starts to build some experience. The experience reveals a great resource of ease, peace, flow, and grace then you go back to your points of view and in contrast you begin to experience how painful points of view really are. Because you're gaining momentum and maturity and confidence and awareness in the natural space of awareness, of existence, of isness, of life, of God, the Creator, emptiness, allness, wholeness, isness, perfection, beauty, that, source, the infinite intelligence that runs rampant throughout all illusory perspectives, thanks to which perspectives are even enabled or made possible. What enables your point of view? What allows for your perspective to be your perspective? To what do you owe the honor of coming up with an opinion? Who or what gave you the power to think? Seek the non-dual one that's at the heart of all experiences, that's always here, always available, always at ease, always free and generous, always free and open, always free and intelligent. And you repeat that. A thought arises, you feel attached to the thought, the thought is not 100% in alignment with the Creator, no thoughts are, even the thought of unconditional love, ultimately, is not truly the Creator. It's very close, but it's still a distortion. As Ra says, the first distortion is that of free will. Even free will, even awareness is a distortion, ultimately. But we're not getting there, here, this session. The first step, which in many ways is almost a final step, it's a one-trick pony to resolve everything, including the journey and the journeyer. is to replace one's attention and descriptive capacity on things, of things, about things, with an intense curiosity for the ease and the openness of that which perceives all things, for that which is, while all things come and go, for that which remains, while all appearances appear, endure, and dissolve, never to be seen again in that way. Like writing in water. The water remains. The writing does not. No trace. 
None of your perspectives leave any trace in this pristine, naked, mirror-like basic space of the infinite existence, accessible to the disillusion, to the surrender of the tension that you hold called me or a point of view. What if you could replace a partial point of view of the infinite creator with the infinite creator itself? Why prefer a tiny, 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 tiny distorted portion of the whole over wholeness? So take your current thought, whatever it may be, and choose to either describe it, think about it, be fascinated by it, or recognize it for the cause of suffering that it is, compare it to the peace. If you compare it to being tortured, whatever thoughts you have right now probably are pleasant, less distorted. But if you compare the innocent thoughts that you currently have with the wholeness and the peace of the view, then you still suffer. It's all relative. From a more absolute point of view, indeed, all forms of consciousness are suffering. It's one perspective, one translation of that contrast at that level. So that ultimately, all wants to be resolved and not left half-assed or half-completed. Everything wants to return to the wholeness, to the view, the allness of the Creator. That's what your thoughts actually, in a very weird and wicked and unconscious way, are trying to do for you. They're attempting to lead you to wholeness. Example, our incessant attempt to acquire safety and security in this physical world and our concerns regarding that financially, relationally, health-wise and so forth and so on so on and so forth it's a thought that attempts to go home you can show it that it's already home it doesn't have to strategize its way into home using objects that don't exist you can cut through the illusion of delusion right now. But it requires a great desire for freedom. All experiences can be resolved by recognizing their creator, their origin, their space, their truth, their essence, rather than their form, or their description, or their partial point of view. Does this make sense? Can you recognize this basic state that I described, or point to? Anyone have trouble recognizing it? Or is unsure? Okay, so now you have no excuse. Thank you for not raising your hand. If you can recognize the basic state, it means you always have the capacity to resolve whatever issue you've got going on. You just don't want to. That's all. It's not difficult to become like the Buddha, to resolve everything back into perfection. It's not hard at all. It's already the case. You just have to give up every other point of view. Well, that's easier said than done. Actually, it's easier done than said. It takes less time to do it than to say it. You just don't want to. You have a fascination with objects. Fascination with your body. And the senses and the hope and the promise of a better future, of a goal achieved. But think about it. The point of view 
that makes you think or hope or feel like there is hope in a future is a point of view that's trying to get home. But it's missing the recognition of home already being here. If you can bring back every thought to its source, if you can take the thought, say, hey, hold on a second, before you run off with your ideas and descriptions, just look where you came from. Just look in what foundation, in what basic state you are appearing. What do you owe your appearance to to begin with? And suddenly that portion of consciousness caught up in that perspective, in that point of view, in that objectifying mechanism, turns around, becomes reflective of the subject, of the formless. And it resolves. If you show a thought, if you show a mind its source, and it sees it clearly enough, it will be resolved. As Ramana Maharshi said, seek for the source of mind, and mind shall disappear. Or even just seek for the mind itself. And you will find its source, and mind will not be there. There will only be source. That's resolved. But it's boring if you want to start an apple farm. That's much more exciting, of course. Or a cookie factory. The promise of a better future withholds us from doing the thing you all just admitted you can't do, which is take a portion of creation and show it its creator. Resolve it. Make it meet its resolve. Complete it. You want to complete creation, accelerate the completion of creation, then take ownership of whatever points of view you have access to and let your job be to resolve each component of your consciousness back into the pristine, clear, awake, vibrant, alive, perfect, natural space from which it came. Show a perspective, its source, over and over and over again. And you will become more rested. The body, as you perceive it, will relax, will calm down, will <sighs> open up, will be freed up. And your delusions will be minimized. Your distortions will be very quickly minimized. This is a direct application of the Law of One. It's not really taught in the Law of One, but it is. It's a direct path. It's not really a path. It's an act. It's a single act repeated over and over again. Take the thought. Now relax the thought. Rest. And recognize the clarity, the vividness, the isness, the aliveness that is before any mind perspective is generated. And then also recognize that this space is also there when the thought is generated. For where else would it appear in? What else would know it? What else would feel it? What awareness does it borrow its consciousness from? You see, everything is borrowed energy from this natural state to which all will return. In fact, nothing ever appears apart from it, outside of it, separate from it, independent from it. None such things exist. There is only one, and all is that one. How deep can you surrender? your point of view right now? How far can you embrace the non-dual one? The perspectiveless one? The emptiness that is aware? Perfect. Natural. Resolved at ease 
joyful, one could even say, or alive. It's not a dead state. It's not a semi-conscious, semi-sleepy state of nothingness. It is alive. It is here. It's pristine. It's more awake than when you're dreaming. It's more awake than when you're thinking. It comes with a sense of clarity. Instant fix of clarity. Here and now awareness of self. And you feel heightened. There's a moment of heightenedness, of increased brightness, increased potential, increased vibrancy, increased awareness of existence. That moment, repeat it. Give all your thoughts to it and see which ones you're still holding on to. And then try to relax those too. Recognize the basic state that pervades them, that permeates them, that gives birth to them, that sustains them, and that will resolve them. And align to this basic state, which is eternal and changeless and timeless and already here. Or you can align to a description, form a point of view, a sense of self, and fight till the death to defend your delusions. From what? There's only source. There's only the natural state. There's only basic space. There is only basic space. There's only natural space. There's only natural space. There's only this epic space. This free, non-dual space. You're fighting to the death to defend a point of view that doesn't really exist from something else that seems to pose it that seems to threaten it, which also does not exist. All the while, in the end, even if you win the battle, all things will resolve anyway. The basic state of emptiness, awareness, existence, pureness is ruler over all points of view. If you know you're going to lose a battle, if it's guaranteed you're going to lose the battle, would you still go to battle? Apparently, yes. If you knew you were never going to be right, You are never going to be the truth in your point of view, ever. It's never going to be true. None of your points of view are ever going to be true. Ever. If you realize this now, will you still make it important and force yourself to go through the habit of pain? When instead you can open your heart and your mind to the natural space of emptiness, bliss, awareness, existence, ease, skillfulness, infinite intelligence, merger with the Creator deeper and deeper, resulting in deeper and deeper peace, deeper and deeper bliss, deeper and deeper intelligence, deeper and deeper wisdom, until it's very, very difficult to consider yourself a human being anymore. Others will see you as such. Others will relate to you as such. But they are dreaming you in their dream. To you, it's not real. You are emptiness, aliveness, existence, bliss, purity, pristineness, clarity, generosity, wholeness, allness. You are them, they are you. There is no distinction, there is no separation. All is resolved. And whenever attention arises, you notice the point of view, and you show the point of view its source. The basic space. That's already here. It's already watching. It already is. And poof! The thought realizes it's unnecessary nature in that moment. It's distortion in that moment is recognized. In contrast to the mirror-like, stainless, steel-like, pristineness of the basic space. That cannot be scratched, that cannot be affected, just like drawing in space does not leave a trace. Just like there is no flight path of a bird. You have to imagine the flight path. You have to say, this is where it came from. 
it isn't actually there. Nothing leaves a trace in awareness. Nothing leaves a trace in the basic space of infinite, eternal, timeless, love, bliss, existence, purity, perfection, non-duality. Oneness, you. This is home. You're already home. All things are already home. Everything that appears is already rested in the basic space of infinite purity. You can be Buddha right now. For you are Buddha. You are the wholeness, the completion, the resolve of all struggle, the end of all suffering, right? But are you willing and courageous enough to surrender? Do you trust enough in God, in Source, in the Infinite One, to bask in its ease? And do you realize your worthiness to not have to struggle with points of view? Do you realize how much you are infinitely loved? In fact, there is no you, apart from the Creator, to be loved or hated. You can never be loved or hated, for you don't exist apart from the Creator, which is responsible for all loving and all hating. But how can it love or hate itself? It would need an independent object, a different universe, that somehow is made of another essence. But all things are made of the one infinite space of the great unity. So praise the Creator, meaning surrender your points of view in favor of the pristine, alive, awake, infinite emptiness of here and now, restful, peaceful result. And relax more and deeper and merge with that. Blend your mind and start blending the mind vibrations with the God vibrations. Start blending your sense of me with the actual me that already existed, thanks to which the sense of me can even be the sense of me. What's before that? What's beyond that? It's already here. The true you is empty and free. The sense of you is derived from it, enabled by it, and owes its existence completely and entirely to it, will eventually resolve back into it, even though it already doesn't exist apart from it, so to think that it has an independent existence is delusion. You will fail that delusion in the end. You will never win that war. You will never be right. The perspective of the separate sense of you will never be true. So defend it all you like. You're a fool. Always have been, always will be. As a separate self. You will always be foolish. You will never be right. Your perspective will never be true. What is true is not a point of view. It's formless. It's indescribable. So stop all descriptions and recognize the indescribable love. The indescribable space. And just pause to blend your mind vibrations with the space vibration for a moment. In other words, turn mind into a mirror that inquires into its source, which is that space of pristine field-like awareness. It's not a point, a view. It's like a field. It's like an omnipresence. It's like space. Everything can be resolved into space. You can't destroy space. You can destroy entire planets, entire galaxies. The space is, was, always shall be timelessly there, holding space for all planets and all things. But awareness is the space holder even of the experience of space. It's even more spacious, more empty, more formless than space, more indestructible. Even if space was to disappear as a perception, this natural state of awareness would still exist.
to recognize it over and over again. Wake up for a moment. Use all your awakeness, all your energy to recognize, to notice, to become aware of, to become present to what already timelessly is, remains, sources and fuels and resolves all appearances. Literally, whatever you're going through right now can be resolved in the basic space. Instead of recognizing things, recognize their nature, their essence, their source. Look at someone and instead of describing them as a thing, just rest in awareness. Don't even see them. Just be. Become more aware of the beingness. The emptiness, beingness, essence, pristineness, purity, perfection. It's always already here. And all things are made of that. They're inseparable. cannot take cloud outside of sky. So form and formlessness are one. The cloud is already resolved. It doesn't even need to disappear. You see, the problem is that you describe the cloud as if it exists apart from sky. Now sure, sunny sky with no clouds is nice every once in a while. Meaning, to have a completely peaceful experience on all levels of existence is nice it's a nice moment, right? But it's not always like that. And it doesn't matter because all things are at peace. A thunderous storm can be just as exciting as long as you recognize that the sky itself can never be harmed by the storm. Now it becomes a joy to encounter the inseparable pristineness and to see the Creator in the form of that thunderstorm. Not as a thought, but as an intrinsic, innate, instinctive recognition that the clouds, that the storm does not exist as anything but bliss. It's a conviction. It's something you need to train yourself to not have your independent view of what appears, but to show every thought its source. To show every storm the sky. The space from which it cannot, not ever, will it escape from that space. Not ever will it be made of or made possible by anything but that space, which is the indestructible, timeless, traceless field of the non-dual creator. So no matter what your storm is, it's okay. It's your description that it's not okay that makes you suffer. In the moment of pain, can you recognize the basic space, even for two to five seconds? Can you show the pain its creation? its creator, its source. Can you show the clouds the sky? Remind the clouds of the sky in which they exist, due to which they exist, apart from which they can never be taken. No other cloud can ever harm sky. Even the death of the cloud still is the victory of sky. And the cloud never had its own existence, so it cannot die. You, anything about you, does not exist apart from the basic space of pure existence of God. So you can't die. Nothing about you can die. But you can surrender your suffering for peace, for aliveness, for intelligence, your delusion, for awakening. But it's up to you. Do you want freedom? Or do you want to suck forever? Believe that there's a problem forever. It's always now. There's no hope in this teaching. Hope is a thought. Show it its source. And it will resolve and leave you at ease. Can you recognize the ease, the flow of grace, 
the presence of a peace that arises. Because this space, when it's recognized, informs the body and the mind with its natural qualities of Satchitananda. So any form of ease, peace, fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness, joy, love, generosity, abundance, these are all levels, if you will, of intensity or concentration or density of Satchitananda, or the original love, light, awareness, isness, bliss, of the unified nature of all that is, the wholeness. When the wholeness is recognized from a partial partial point of view, when a partial point of view is taken back to its source and it awakens to its wholeness, it's resolved. As a result, it becomes more transparent to the natural Satchitananda, the inseparable quality of bliss that pervades every experience. Peace, love, isness, freedom, generosity, unity, resolve, completion, perfection. Show me a tool that will lead you to a better place than this. Show me a tool based in descriptions and things and objects and goals and getting somewhere and fixing something that will ultimately win over the peace from which all those tools appeared, from which the process and the phenomena you apply the tools to appeared, inside of which it appears, and once it's all gone, the space still arises. Sorry, the space still exists. Show me something that will outsmart existence, awareness, emptiness, bliss. If you can find me a tool that's better than existence itself, please do challenge me. But if you can realize, like the Buddha did, like the rare one does, the rare mature soul, if you can realize that in the end it's all doomed to resolve into perfection anyway. So instead of resisting the perfection that's already here by believing that it's not and that you need to do something to get there, instead of trying to fight that battle and be right in it and be proven right in it, if you really realize that you will never ever 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 win that argument, How could you win? You can resolve right now. All it takes is logic. The Buddha was logical before his awakening. The Buddha recognized there's no end to suffering. So then what is the result? That takes the attention back to source instead of forward into a tool that can possibly help fix something inside of creation that's already based on a delusional partial point of view that has no foundation other than the resolved emptiness perfection that's already here, already watching the whole thing. And so there is no end to delusion. Delusion can never fix delusion. It's only ending delusion now that will end delusion forever. Unless you conjure it up again. Then you end it again. You cannot end delusion with delusion or if inside delusion. You cannot apply a point of view to another point of view and hope to attempt the view, or hope to attain the view. The view is. It doesn't care how advanced you are. The view is. God is. It sees all equally. And it's now. There is no other time than now. You've never experienced anything but now. You just think you have. But you're always now, looking from now, looking at now, looking through now, looking as now, looking to now, looking, 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 looking. Or as someone else once said, paraphrasing, when what's looking is looking for what's looking in what it's looking at, it's in big trouble. When what is looking is looking for what is looking 
in that which is looking at, it's in big trouble. If what's looking is looking for what's looking, inside of that which is looked at, it's in big trouble. Yet that's what we attempt, that's what we hope, that's what we fight for. This never-ending chess game. This illusion that you're going to win against the Creator. That your point of view will be one day proven right. I was right. See, God, I told you so. See? I was separate and I had a problem. You see? The problem was real. Told you so. It will never happen. It will just never happen. So your journey is doomed. You will never be free of suffering from inside the realm of the sufferer. The sufferer cannot liberate itself. It needs to recognize its source, the basic space. But if we jump out too far, and we're already inside of a thought, and we're already believing it, it becomes more and more challenging to bring it back to source. It becomes more and more arrogant as it runs away from its natural state of humility. We just get so righteous about our delusion. We really, 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 really think that we have a good point of you. So the mature one is the one who desires the view, which is peaceful, non-dual, non-separatist, sees all as itself, simply basks in the isness of the emptiness, of the awakeness of the Creator, of Source. The mature soul is okay with that. It's curious for that. Doesn't call it boring. It's actually very fascinated. After a life of suffering, suddenly peace seems very exciting. Whereas when you haven't suffered enough yet, peace seems boring. Right? It's an oversimplification, but basically that's the difference between maturity when it comes to the direct path teaching or immaturity. It's how far can you see into the future and realize that you're doomed. And when you realize that your journey as a delusional soul is doomed, will you still fight that war? And if so, what for then? If you see that you'll never attain what you think you will attain by doing the delusion cycle, you see you will never win, you will never get it. Never. The thing that you do it for, the purpose behind the delusion cycle, and entering it and feeding it and feeling it and feeling it and identifying with it and defending it and describing it, the reason for doing so will never be completed, will never be fulfilled. The intention that started that is wrong. The sufferer will never liberate itself. Good thing, the space already doesn't give a shit. It's right here, right now, already free, already awake. So you don't have to worry about anything I just said. You just recognize the basic space of awareness. Stop thinking about what I say. Just be what I speak from, which is yourself. The formless. Can you find joy and resolve and humility and love and satisfaction and curiosity in deepening the blending of your personal attention into the basic space beyond the personal attention? Is that an activity, the activity of conscious, deliberate awareness of being? 
is that something you can get excited about? Or is your to-do list more fascinating even though you will never complete it and it will never get to the point that it thinks is going to get to? So then the Bodhisattva's only desire that remains is, although ultimately also delusional, is to facilitate the awakening of many inside the dream to also remember that they're not the dream. But we've gotten so used to thinking of ourselves as a body, as something that has a form, as something that exists inside of a location, that formless isness seems just too weird to abide in. It's too formless for us to do anything with. And we're so conditioned to do something with something. Pure beingness It will take some time to get used to pure beingness until it takes over all doingness, all thinkingness. But then you see that even in the illusion, everything is facilitated by a shift in being. There's nothing else. You've never done anything. Ultimately, the feeling of doership is also illusory. Don't replace this with thoughts of, okay, now what then? That misses the point. That's a thought too. Show it its source, which is alive. You have to turn your attention to the aliveness of the Creator, to the aliveness of the formlessness, to the potential of the formlessness, to the awakeness of the formlessness. That has to become the active ingredient that motivates you. But all is well and all is the Creator, even points of view. But the more you can recognize the view inside the point of view, or the Creator inside of the form, the formless inside of the form, the emptiness inside of the form, the greater your transparency to Satchitananda, clarity, love, isness, awakeness, vividness, aliveness, brightness, isness, purity, perfection will become. And the less you will think of yourself, your thoughts, your emotions, your experiences and your environment as existing separate from you or God. And then all your troubles will resolve themselves. All your misaligned perspectives that fuel your suffering will be resolved and you'll be greater and greater, you'll experience greater and greater ease as your main state. Any questions? If so, recognize the basic space from which they appear, in which they reside, and to which they will lose. Lose early on. Lose now. Quit. Quit before you even start. It's the only way to win. doesn't mean you don't play or does, don't allow the play to play, but you recognize the basic state of the play more than you are lost in the descriptions about the play. And more and more that shifts and more and more the world disappears and God becomes your predominant view. The creator, unity, perfection starts to suffuse your awareness, starts to enter your awareness so much so that the world becomes less and less tangible, more and more dreamlike, less and less solid and reliable. From the form-based, physical-based entity, it's really hard to imagine 
But from that space, it's recognized that physicality is nothing but imagination itself. And that to stop imagining is possible, delicious. And what is revealed when you stop imagining creation is the in eternal infinite space. And all things are resolved in that already. The final healings where you see that nothing ever happened. Imagine. How healing is that? Nothing ever happened. That means you don't have to heal. From what? Who? From where? Nothing ever happened. There's only God. You're left with only God and the clear realization that nothing ever happened. Heal what? Heal who? There's only source. There's only God. There's only love, isness, awareness. Beyond that, even that disappears. And there's just the infinite, indescribable perfection. With no love and no light. But so perfect. Even love is a distortion compared to perfection. Compared to the one, original, infinite. Free will, awareness, love and light, they are all distortions. They are the least distorted, but they could never compete with the real thing. But they are the bridge. Love, light, awareness, emptiness, beingness, isness, aliveness, consciousness is the bridge. And it is already in itself incomparably amazing when it comes to the human experience. It's already liberating. It's already enlightening. So it's a process of continually just dissolving. Just, ooh, you drop something that you held on to. Oh, okay. I don't have to carry this. Oh, I didn't realize I was carrying this. Oh, I was carrying this. Huh. You're undoing yourself. Unwinding yourself. Letting go. You're letting go, you're letting go, you're letting go. Then you're letting go of the personal ego. Then you let go of the soul ego. Then you let go of the God ego. Until there's nothing left to let go of. That is perfection, without distortion, called the Absolute. When even love is let go of, when even light is let go of, when even unity awareness is let go of, when even oneness is let go of, then there's just the One, the Absolute One. And it's already here. Want it. Or don't. But if you want it, it will liberate you. It will feel amazing. If you don't want it, it will feel like a chore. If any of this feels like a chore, like, ah, I really, I kind of don't want, I get it, it's cool, but I don't want to do it. Then just suffer some more. Prove your point. Try to win this courtroom situation with you against the one infinite creator. Keep your thoughts. Hold on to them tight. Defend them. Come up with all kinds of other points of view to prove the original thought of me right. And bring your case to the one infinite intelligence that governs all galaxies and all dimensions simultaneously without even blinking. But prove your point, that your problems are real, your suffering is real, and you don't have what you want. Hold on to that and bring it to the Creator, see what happens. And then you'll get more and more excited to just choose the side of the Creator, which is sightless. It's the allness, the wholeness, the isness, 
It pervades all partial points of view. He will become so sensitive to being partial, to taking on a partial point of view of the creation, that it will feel harmful to you to do so. To hold on to a thought will feel so disastrously harmful, it's like you're squeezing the life out of a puppy. You would not do that today, because you're sensitive enough to not do that. It would hurt you. To actually do that would hurt you. It would churn your stomach. You would not feel good at all. So when I see someone defend a point of view, that's what I feel like. It's like I see them squeeze a puppy to death. You will, in time, develop the same sensitivity. You'll be able to cope with it. But it's like walking around in a world where everyone around you is torturing puppies all the time. You'll get used to that too. You'll see that that too is the creator deluding itself. But that's what it feels like. So forgive me for my fierceness and my anger sometimes. Or don't. I've already forgiven myself for it anyway. But you'll never win. You're literally fighting the Creator with every thought that you have. Now once you realize this, inspiration arises rather than thinking. And intelligence will begin to inform the body and the mind and its movements and its choices and its directions and its focal points. You don't have to worry about this. It's not you that's going to be doing that. You'll be chilling in peace. And the Creator will take over the body and the mind and its actions, in a way. There's degrees to this, infinite spectrum of this. But in a way, you could describe it that way. God takes over occupancy. Right now, it's the delusion, the sufferer, that's trying to prove a point against the Creator, that's resisting the Creator, fighting the Creator, all the time, that's occupying the body and the mind. That's free will. Free will having become distorted and distorted and distorted. It will never win. And the end game is that you are the creator and none of this ever happened. So fuck you. Get it? Fuck you. Love making. I love you. Right? It was, I just said I love you. Fuck you. Fuck you and your stupid court case against the Creator. <laughs> the only thing that's alright in my feeling state to do, to want, to desire, to create, to allow this to be utilized for, the only way that I stay pure, even though I'm doing things, I mean, I'm originally pure, you are all originally pure. Of course, you can't ultimately go against that, but on a relative sense, is by making everything that I do come from that awareness, and then actually, its only motivation is benefit. Its only motivation is benefit. Benefiting the whole, awakening the whole, Generating awareness, aliveness, passion, which is good. Passion is not necessarily enlightenment, but to be passionate about your creation will definitely generate a greater level of self-awareness in your interaction with the dream. No? So when I throw a party, I give, I give to that party. It's generating. It's, it's inspiring to generate that party. Because it generates a passion, an awakeness, a field, a vibration of love that has a higher density in which it's more likely for that individual to not only wake up more to the dream, but also wake up from the dream. Although that's unlikely, but it's more possible, it's more probable. 
So my actions, therefore, are to generate experiences that help generate passion and awakeness and aliveness so the Creator can wake up to itself in all these different ways. All the court cases can end. And we can sing Kumbaya, kind of like we did late last night. When you give up, you win. You ever had that? When you're like, you're trying so hard to win a game. And your brother or sibling or whatever is like, ah, oh, they're beating you just by a little bit every time. It's like, ah. Oh. And you're so close. And then you realize, fuck it. I don't have to play this shit again. I don't have to play it. You surrender and you're like, fuck, I won. You're still, you're still trying to win. You're still like, ooh, you're still fighting. I'm free. I can do whatever I want now. I'm not tied to the fucking game. If you give up, not, not give in, like, ugh, ugh, life sucks, it's meaningless, I can't do anything, like, nothing matters, uh, because he said this, or he said that, or some teacher said this. No, that's thought, that's delusion, you're not waking up, you gotta wake up. It's vibrant and alive, it's not an unconscious field of nothingness, where you're sort of half asleep, and yeah, yeah, I feel there's nothing there. No! If it's not awake, it's not real. If it's not alive, it's not here, it's not real. You gotta wake up, not fall asleep in a different thought that mimics enlightenment. Enlightenment is awakening. You have to be awake for it. You have to be present to it. You have to be alive. You have to be passionate. You have to be curious. You have to be intense. The higher the density, the higher the intensity, the higher the concentration of light and self-awareness. And so you increase the brightness of awareness, aware of its own existence over and over and over again. Tune up. Turn up the demo switch. Increase the brightness of the Creator aware of itself. And then let it inform the body and the mind. Don't even worry about it. You just recognize perfection. The perfection of all things, of all beings. Keep attuning to that. Keep attuning to that one infinite perfection underlying all form and form will be reinformed by an intelligence that's not of the mind, that's not of the ego. That's a little crazy. Sometimes. It has no form. You rest in it right here, right now. It's a decision you make every single time. And it's a decision that comes with a slightly increased awareness or sense of existence or sense of aliveness. Every single time. You're bumping up, you're tuning up that clarity of isness, of awakening, that moment of awakening from the spell of thinking. And you start more and more aligning to that basic space which never leaves, it's always here, it's timeless, and you're already doing it. And you're already competent in this to some extent. Just become more competent in it. Become more naturally aligned to it. Become more surrendered to it. The only reason it feels like an effort to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth is because A, you see that the fourth and the back are separate, but ultimately, form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. Delusion is the truth, and truth is delusion. It doesn't exist apart from each other, because there's only one. However, that's an advanced realization that you really have to see, to get. You really have to get it, to get it. To make it experiential. But the other reason is, the more common reason, or more workable reason, is because you haven't surrendered yet. You're still trying to prove your point to yourself because there's nothing but you. But you're pretending like there's some something else out there that you're having to prove yourself to or win from or attain or acquire when all the time the natural perfected space is already here before any attempt can ever be made at achieving perfection. You're already perfect. So it's a resting back into, it's a resolving, it's a allowing to dissolve. It's a letting go. It's not a process of becoming, it's a process of unbecoming. With clarity, with heightened awareness, 
you're unbecoming. So you're becoming less and less and less, but more and more awake. Empty awareness. Instead of content-based dreaming, it becomes empty awareness. And it's formless, and it takes some time to get used to. Because you're so used to thinking of yourself as a body in a location. So used to it. That even when I talk about awareness, you filter it from that point of view, and you imagine it as something. But when you actually start undoing your perceptions, breaking them down, and you'll meet barriers of scaredness, because, well, what about this formlessness? Who am I? Where will I be? It's because you've filtered it from being so used to thinking that you're the body inside of a world. That's an assumption. It's a thought that's never been found to be true. You've never experienced the body and you've never experienced the location. You just thought location and you thought experience and you thought sensation. What is, is. What is not, is not. Stop trying to prove that what is not, is. Be what is. Melt in the melting influence of the Creator's ease. The spacious love, spaciousness, satisfaction, contentment, and just the clarity and the creativity that begins to inform the body and the mind so skillfully. You could never do that with your brain. Allow the silence of that space to become more and more overwhelming. Allow the emptiness and the clarity of that space to become more and more overwhelming. To replace your points of view with the view. To replace your assumption of self and location with an unlocation, formless, indescribable, already here. The Creator's infinite, timeless perfection. That, my friends, is enlightenment the path towards it. Into it. One of the intentions behind this incarnation is to say it clearer than it's ever been said so that it can be heard more easily. So if you can't hear it here, I doubt you'll hear it anywhere else. The cause of not recognizing this realization is a desire for other things. That's all. You all have the capacity to recognize it and it's never been said clearer. So this is the opportunity to see where you're at, what you truly want, to not judge where you're at, to not judge what you truly want, but to observe and realize that in the end you will lose the battle of argumenting with creation, trying to prove your point. It's already here. You're already free. Already. Before attaining perfection, you're already free. You're already perfect. Before that one thing, that one meditation you need to do to get this dog, you're already free. Before you even get what I'm saying here, before you get that you're already free, you're already free. Before that. It's always before whatever you think it is. Oh, nope. It's not that either. It's already there. It was already there. Always look backwards in time prior to your thought about whatever you have your thought about including your thought about your meditation, your spiritual journey, judging yourself, judging where you're at, trying to get somewhere, and recognize, turn that thought around and show it its source, where it came from, what was prior to the thought. And you see nothing but source, nothing but empty freedom. But then you have to accept it. 
like, oh, wait, do I want that? So I see, yeah, there's empty freedom. But do I want it? Do I want to be curious for it? Do I want to merge and blend my mind with awareness, with faith, with God? And if so, to what extent? Find out. Be what you're going to be after all is said and done. Be it now. What will you be when all is said and done? When you've done it all, you've experienced it all, you've fought it all, you've won it, you've lost it many, many times over. When you've seen and done it all, what then will you collapse into? What then will you surrender to? What then will you be? Imagine that and be it now, more and more. Fall in love with that state now. It will speed up the process of going from it being attached to delusion to simply resting as the natural state and having all points of view be resolved more and more. The infinite intelligence taking over occupancy of the body and the mind for the purpose of awakening this dream. But you're not this body and this mind, neither am I. So nothing is lost. Everything is gained in the vision of what you really are. There's always this background awareness. There's always this underlying space inside of which all things appear. You can always recognize it until it becomes more and more automatic, natural, just there. All right, this is fun. Let's swim. in love of the union of all of us here and all of us not here. For we are as one with those that are not here as those that are. We're all points of view of the view. Rest is the view, and you'll start to see more as God sees. Be more as God is. Less as a person, more as the perfection. But you need to want this. You need to have some level of maturity in recognizing that most of your desires are absolutely flawed and doomed, irrelevant, impure, don't contribute anything beautiful to your life. They're delusional delusionally produced desires. They're not truthfully produced inspirations. Inspiration is very different than wants. In a state of inspiration, you don't want anything. You're aligned. Things flow and happen and occur according to an intelligence that informs the experience. You rest into that intelligence and the intelligence will start to inform you, infuse you. That's it. One trick pony. <laughs>